Recording in progress. So I can see we've got people joining us now. We'll give it a few more minutes. Welcome to those that have joined. Good to see so many already. Welcome. We'll just give it a couple more minutes and then we'll, we'll get started. Okay, if we give it one more minute, we'll just wait for a few more just to, to join in. I'm sure we'll have more uh, as we conduct the session and we'll get started. Okay, we're coming up to two minutes past. I think we're good to go. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jason Smith. Uh, I head up growth uh, here at Nullscape uh, in the UK. Uh, I will also be your moderator for today's session around hypercontextualized learning. Uh, we've got a great uh, packed discussion for you where we'll be talking about the importance of hypercontextualized learning. Uh, how it will elevate your learner experience and with custom simulations and what that means for your organization in terms of impact. Uh, we're very lucky today. We've got some, we've got three uh, really well sought after guests. We've got uh, Sarah. Sarah joins us from uh, Chubb as the global talent manager uh, there. She leads uh, Chubb's global digital uh, upskilling and reskilling uh, agenda as well. Uh, as well as equipping talent for, for their, their challenging careers there and, and supporting the continued growth in the marketplace uh, there as well. We've also got Pratima. Uh, so Pratima is an experienced executive with a demonstrated history of designing and implementing transforming uh, transformation programs in IT, manufacturing, the media industry, and alignment in driving business results. Uh, we also have our very own Rajiv as well, who is our founder and CEO of Nullscape. Uh, Rajiv has built a global team that's pioneering in the space of experiential learning and assessments, 
for organizations at scale impacting over 400 plus organizations uh, globally now in over 20 countries. So welcome all of you. It's great to have you with us. Uh, a little bit about um, Nullscape and who we are, just so you've got some context of us. Uh, as mentioned, we are a global organization. Our, our expertise is in experiential learning. That's learning by doing. We truly believe that to unlock human potential uh, and brilliance, uh, there needs to be that elements of learning by doing alongside traditional learning methods as well. So we really focus on there and what hypercontextualize means within all of that. Uh, you can see some of our strategic partners there in NIIT uh, and some of the amazing clients that we get to work with globally uh, as well, just to give you a sense of who we are. Getting to the discussion then, so why has hypercontextualized learning become such an important topic for organizations uh, and why is it needed more than ever in today's environment? Um, so we, we already know that according to the World Economic Forum, 1.1 billion jobs could be transformed over the next decade. Organizations are resting with probably some of the fastest change they'll ever be, and it's only getting quicker. And so traditional learning methods no longer suffice in terms of enabling that change and, and closing some of the gaps as, the, as we're transitioning so quickly. Also knowing, closing the knowing doing gap inside organizations. So we know context combined with great content is what really enables people to connect the dots and, and move behavior and start to apply what they've learned. And furthermore, the lack, we know the lack of uh, contextualized learning impacts engagement, motivation in the learning process, uh, creates inefficiencies, reduces productivity, and causes a widening of skills and performance gaps inside organizations. So it's become more important in L&D strategies ever than before. Uh, but I'm not just the expert in this space. We've got three experts in the room that are going to be talking about this. Before we kick off, just to demystify what uh, hyper-contextualized learning means, Rajiv, would love to you just to dive in, give us a, a bit of a description around the difference between hyper-contextualized learning, custom learning, uh, and, and bespoke learning. What does that mean in this context? All right, that's a great question. Uh, first of all, uh, hello everybody. Hello Pratima, hello uh, Sarah. Great to be on the session with, uh, with, with both of you. Um, so one of the catchphrases for the digital age is that one size does not fit all. We understand this intuitively as consumers, right? On uh, Instagram or your Amazon page, your page is different from mine because my preferences are different and my um, you know, history is different and so on, right? But when it comes to learning, somehow uh, we have a, a canned approach uh, to learning and that's always been a choice in front of uh, organizations. Should I uh, use off the shelf content or should I customize it, right? That's always been the question in front of uh, decision makers. Um, no problem with that. I think that's great. Uh, off the shelf uh, products are great um, because it does um, uh, help organizations quickly ramp up. There are cer certain must-have skills that people need, and there are certain standards that we need to adhere to. So off-the-shelf is great. But, um, you know, the context is also very important, right? Because what maybe trust building me means in an organization could be very different from, uh, from organization to organization. So there is a difference um, that we'll need to account for. So that's where uh, this whole idea of hyper-contextualization comes in. Uh, so I just want to highlight the difference between personalization, something that we've been hearing about for quite a, uh, quite a long time, and what hyper-contextualization actually means. Personalization, to begin with, uh, is learning offered uh, to the learner uh, or learning meeting the learner where they are, uh, right? So depending on their background, their skill set, you know, certain uh, modules are offered to them that's just right for them, right? So that's personalization. Now that's great uh, at an individual level that works. Now at an organizational level, one of the things that we, uh, we, we all know is that change is just, is just unprecedented, right? Uh, so from the time you launch a program uh, to uh, the program hitting the ground um, to people consuming that content, things have changed uh, quite a bit, right? So that static, custom building of content doesn't work anymore, which is where this hyper-contextualization element comes in. 
So one size does not fit all. And one thing I want to just insert in that narrative is also hyper contextualization is great, but I do believe that learning has to become experiential, right? Uh, that's the other important part because no session today gets uh, done without chat GPT getting mentioned, right? So when you think about the role of chat GPT in learning, that's taking personalization to a very different level, right? Depending on my prompt, exactly what I need. Um, so chat GPT serves up the right kind of information and insights. So if information and insights are all done, what does a learning program do then? Uh, should not be focusing on just knowledge, should not be even focusing on insight, it should be focusing on experience. And I often quote this um, Einstein's uh, classic statement, right? Uh, experience is learning. Everything else is just information. So one size does not fit all. Experience is everything. You combine the two things, you get hyper-contextualized experiential learning. Thanks, Rajiv. I bet we can't get through the chat without talking about chat GPT and AI at some point throughout the conversation as well. That, that's always the topic. I'm gonna to throw it out to the audience really quick. Um, just to do a quick poll uh, around is hypercontextualized learning the need of the hour in today's dynamic environment? So we're just going to post that up now just so that you can see that. That should come into your screens. As we go through the conversation, please use the chat and the Q&A. The team in the background will be picking those up. We'll try and get to some of those as well and, and weave them in amongst the other questions that we've got and, and included. Uh, but if you could just answer that question, let's see how we do with that. As you do that, there's going to be three areas that we're going to really aim to address uh, across the conversation with us all. Uh, the first is understanding and getting some clarity around hypercontextualized learning. So awareness around that, its impact inside organizations. And so we're going to pull on uh, Sarah, Pratima, your experience around hypercontextualized learning, what that means for you and, and how you've been addressing some of that inside your organizations. And then we're going to give a bit of around. So what can you do around it? You know, how do you start going about implementing that? Uh, and we've got one of our product team who's going to be talking about our latest um, uh, Genie platform, which allows you to author your own simulations and experiential hypercontextualized learning. So we'll talk a bit about that uh, later on. But first, let's just set the scene around some of those questions. So we'll let the poll go for a minute. And, and Sarah, I'd like to go to you first in, in terms of the, a question. So how have you seen learning development really shift over the last five years? And, and where does hyper-contextualized learning fit for you? And what does that mean? Sure, um, it's a great, great question to start us off. So it's, uh, I'm super excited to be here. Pratima, I'm looking forward to learning from yourself as well, Rajiv. It's great to see you again. So very excited for this conversation. Um, and as I think about this, um, the context that we're now working in, I, I have to admit, I am a little bit more skeptical about some of the nature of change. I think some of the change that we talk a lot about can be a little bit overhyped. Um, you know, I guess it's that, that thing where everyone thinks that the time they're living through all the last few years is the most change they've ever seen. And you look back, you know, over, I don't know, 20, 30, 50 years historically, and you think actually, you know, in the broad context of things, we, we always think that what we're going through is the most change. Um, however, having said that, I think there are um, some changes in the business context, the market context that we are all experiencing that are really evolving um the the way that we work and the way therefore that we need to learn so when i think about learning needs jason to your question i really try to relate it back to um business outcomes and market context and so yeah. i think as we see those start to evolve we therefore see learning needs start to evolve and for me, whilst we, the only constant is change. I mean, I think that's been true for a while, but you know, we're, we're certainly, I would say we all live and breathe that every day. Um, there are also some longer term market shifts we see around the rise of, you know, automation, AI, et cetera, and what that's meaning in terms of jobs and activities evolving, and therefore a change in what people need to learn and how they need to learn it. And so for me, hyper-contextualized learning is really important because as we see the 
um, reduction in less value adding tasks due to the ability to automate them. What's left, if I can term that, is really about the value that we as humans can add to whatever we, we touch and do. And so, so much of that comes down to a, a, um, a bigger focus, I think, maybe on what gets termed a little bit um, derogatively kind of soft skills. They're not soft, they're incredibly important, but we term them as soft or transferable skills. And also um, the mix of various skills that allows you to be productive and do something. And so to Rajiv's point, you know, when you look at kind of off the shelf training or training that you customize, typically it might focus on a skill or a topic, you know, think about feedback, think about um, I don't know, Python coding or whatever, but actually the beauty of hyper-contextualized learning is it allows you to bring a variety of skills to bear in terms of how you actually work and do stuff. Um, you don't, you know, when you might, you may learn about feedback, for example, in a silo, but when you give feedback or using a variety of different skills, your communication skills, your ability to read the room, a whole bunch of other stuff, not just the theory on feedback. And so for me, as the rise of um, those softer and transferable skills becomes even more important to allow people to be successful in a context where we are able to automate some of those less value adding activities. Um, and as we look to leverage um, you know, new technologies and new, new thoughts and new tools such as hyper contextualized learning, it means that we can allow people to more quickly gain knowledge and experience and more quickly be impactful in terms of not just a skill or a topic but how to be more impactful in what you do and so translating learning making it really real and allowing people to go away and do something different after coming out of a learning experience that for me is kind of a, as an overall is um the macro piece of what we see changing what we're able to take advantage of and how hyper contextualized learning really supports that I really like that, especially you talked about the human element within that as well as the translating that into the doing as well uh, inside organizations. And, and Pratima, how about you in, in terms of your experience as well? Um, how would you, you know, view that inside your organization and, and how important is it in, as Sarah described there, such a dynamic environment that there is now? So thank you first and foremost to Nolskip team for having me here. And it's equally exciting, Sarah, to learn from you as well and from other people on the panel. Um, well, very interesting. And I like the way you said it, Sarah. It's a lot to do also with the human aspects uh, besides just the understanding of hyper-contextualizing the learning. Um, since we're talking about what it looks like in my organization, let me give you the context of the organization. We are a financial uh, fraud and crime protection company. We're very proud to do what we do. We uh, take care of all the financial transactions, trillions plus, plus, plus uh, for all the banks that we serve. And most of the banks, whether it's European banks uh, or the US banks are our customers. So what are we dealing with? We are dealing with hackers who keep looking at every possible technology um, and wanting to hack into the various banking systems, whether it is to hack it for um, an identity theft, you know, somebody using Pratima as an identity to log in and uh, create fraudulent transactions or whatever. So this is just one aspect of it. There are multiple things like mules, uh, money mules, basically, or um, anti-money laundering, and we fight these products. If you want to fight these kind of scenarios, you have to have engineers who develop products which are very relevant, one, to the changing dynamic of the market, and two, who are updated all the time on the latest possible technology. To my mind, all of this has to be only in a situation where you can contextualize what it means for them to know and learn these things and apply it on their job. Um, and this is what actually keeps me on my toes. I mean, l &D takes up most of my time, very unlike in a global HR role, you, you tend to say, oh, compensation, uh, employee engagement, yes, of course, they're all important, but this is my bread and butter. Yeah? Unless we, as an HR community, make sure that our people are understanding what it means to learn a certain topic, how is it adding value to the job? Um, and we have very wonderful program and something which I would definitely give an example of is 
the engineering toolbox. So unlike what you said, I mean, Sarah, what you kind of alluded to, and Jason, you also in the earlier point where you were saying, well, um, it's not about an individual personal need of training. It's more about the business need. So we have this engineering toolbox where we have role-based definitions and understanding of what is expected in that job. And which is very, again, I'm using this word very consciously contextualized to the need of the business uh, environments. Uh, so I think it's, it's. I wouldn't say we are uh, we're doing fantastically well there as of now. It's a very recent initiative. It's too early to talk about the success and the outcomes. But to my mind, we are on the right path. And I think organizations need to really, uh, and I, I would also add one point before I give it back to you, Jason, but there are many organizations who've done that in the past. I'm sure nobody wants to give irrelevant trainings out, uh, but we haven't really bridged the gap of how does it help you on the job. And I think that's the change that we're trying to build in and bring in with this engineering toolbox initiative that we're running. Um, so yeah, well, that's the that's the first thought. And back to you, Jason. Thanks, Prasper. Thank you both for the, those insightful comments. I you, you touched there on um, connecting to the business need as well, which I think is so important inside organizations. That's it's what's it in service of that's really important to, to help move the dial on, on those. And we'll we'll come back to how you can measure that and what do you do to measure, you know, the impact of, of some of those. But you also touched on technology. And I'd love, Prasma, just as you you describe that, just could you elaborate on some of the technology and how that plays a role? in hyper-contextualized learning for you? Absolutely important. We are a tech organization, so that's, uh, that's again, the primary focus for us. Um, and without sounding like a marketing example, I would like to appreciate uh, the partnership with Nullscape. Uh, I would love to talk about the program that I'm running with them because that's completely experiential learning like what Rajiv, you suggested right at the beginning. Um, so, the most, so we're running a program which is for the leaders, the top notch leaders of uh, NICE Actimize. And uh, it's again contextualized to the, to the need of the business. Um, what we're trying to there, do there is completely focus on them being able to run business, which means can they be my next level PNL leaders? So unless you run a PNL, you don't know what it means. Now I can't risk that. I can't have these leaders out there in the open trying to run a business without having an understanding of running a business. So the simulations which they are going through, uh, which Nullscape, uh, I'm using the Nullscape platform for that. And you know they are helping us with finding the right, appropriate product-oriented, um, you know, product organization-oriented simulations, uh, which are relevant to um, the NICE, Actimize team. And people are experiencing that. And that has been the most successful initiative or most successful program within the multitude of programs that we're offering to this team. So I totally believe that experiential learning helps, but the most important point is you cannot often give experiential learning um, in real time. So technology is a great enabler to give that real time experience much in advance before the people take on the roles. And you know there's the, the business has nothing to lose especially in a high stake or high risk environments. So technology has a fairly large role to play. We have Nullscap uh, that we're using very, very strongly for many of our programs. Uh, we're also using uh, our internal own technology to kind of keep things updated, but those are more driven from the point of view of, you know, how do I really, um, you know, make use of the training data? Uh, we also run our own Actimize University. So te technology again is a very big enabler there. Uh, but those are more internal focused uh, tools, but we need it. We, we can't do without it. Nice. Thank you. And, and Sarah, I know we, as we stay on the topic of connecting to business impact and, and business goals, organizational goals, strategies, and, and linked to that, how does hyper-contextualized learning impact in your organization, the goals, the strategy, the values, Cascade? How do you, how do you think about the role it plays in all of that? Yeah, so um, I think for me, and just to build on Pratima's previous point, um, the, the benefit of technology is for me allowing 
democratization of good practice learning and access at scale. Um, and so, and tying that back to your question around kind of um, uh, org values and, and those sorts of things. Um, so for me, if I think about kind of the evolution of learning, um, uh, learning availability within organization, right? So you have these kind of, as we were talking about before, you have this kind of off the shelf products, this content, this relatively generic content, it's not aligned to your businesses. Um, strategy, kind of goals, out, all that sort of stuff, but it delivers, learn, it allows someone to upskill themselves in a topic, but then they have to do the work to apply that generic topic to their role, to their team, to their context, to their um, objectives, all that sort of stuff. And so there's, there's work that they have to do post learning to go and actually realize the value and benefit of that learning. Um, yeah. And let's be honest, right? We know that that is hard. We are all working in environments where everyone has too much work to do and not enough people and we bounce in and say hey guys let's do some learning and people can see the you know the long-term strategic benefit of that you know yes it will help me it, it will help me execute this thing better it will um support my growth and development it will turn me into a better leader all that sort of stuff but in the moment do they really have time a to consume that learning and then b to do the mental gymnastics of okay what does this mean for my role how do i move forward etc with it and so the beauty of of, um, for me, the hyper contextualized learning piece and the platform around the ability to kind of customize and make bespoke content in that model, right, is allowing what we know to be good practice learning principles, right, around um, it has to be real, it has to be um, relevant to me, it has to be engaging, it has to align to my job, all that sort of stuff. It allows us to do that at scale. Uh, and, and so we, we genuinely are, you know, so whereas kind of platforms like LinkedIn Learning five, 10 years ago, etc., democratized access to learning content, what you guys offer now, which is so exciting for me in terms of this platform, this ability to kind of um, also create, you know, our own um, simulations and hyper contextualized learning that aligns back to our organization is it allows really good practice learning principles that we all know drive the difference between an okay learning experience and a great learning experience. It allows us to drive that at scale. And so to, not just to democratize access to learning content, but to democratize the ability to leverage a learning experience in order to have impact in someone's role, in order to allow that person to grow their career, in order for them to realize the benefits in a way that is kind of less intensive or less reliant on them having to consume something and then go away and do their homework and do their reflection and do their thinking which we know which is practically right people are less likely to do given how busy they are in in their jobs and the demands on their time so um and for me you know, from a purpose perspective for me that's hugely powerful and really impactful in terms of the the impact we can have on people at scale um, which is super exciting and so sorry to come <laughs> I'm dancing around your question a little bit but to come back and actually answer sorry. your question um, the the piece around being able to contextualize learning to the organization's market context economic context right um, values um, objectives the team culture those sorts of things it's just it's it's so so impactful because it makes learning more relevant more real and it allows you to for a more efficient route from a to b towards gaining benefit from that learning so i, I love the trajectory that that you guys are on and as, or, as an organization right whereby you have this this library of um hyper contextualized learning yeah. simulations which is already a step change in terms of what you know other players in the market are offering around just you know off the shelf videos and stuff. But then now this next step change in terms of being able to contextualize and make real for an organization even more, um, which all of it is just adding more and more value to an individual learner in terms of realizing the return on investment from the time they spend learning to the impact it's having on their jobs and their roles. So massively important and the ability to do that, for me, that is the game changer in terms of um, employees realizing benefit from it and also you know looking back to our L&D teams right the the way that our instructional designers and those sorts of teams work and that the the um, asks we're making of them to make learning more impactful. I think you've touched on so many golden nuggets there just to, to capture and bring out and 
the scale piece, I think, is really important. I often hear from clients that I've worked with in the past, you know, we can deliver great amounts of in, impact in a small area of the business, but how do we really scale that and make sure that we're helping connect the dots between ultimately some elements of theory into real practical things that I can do in my day job. And I, I think you articulated that really well in terms of how that starts to, to help as part of that. And that's certainly been something that we, we've been looking at. Rajiv, anything you would add in terms of that conversation? I thought there was some absolute gold in both there. Yeah, um, excellent points, both Pratima and Sarah, really um, insightful. So just to throw some data points um, into this conversation, right? Um, a couple of things that we are hearing a lot, and I'm sure uh, all of us are able to relate to what I'm going to say now. Um, almost 50 to 70% of um, headcount today in any organization has joined in the last two years, right? Uh, without formal onboarding, like physical onboarding, no role modeling, um, right? All of that stuff um, post COVID, which makes uh, hyper contextualized learning all the more important because, um, you know, we need to reestablish that context of the newer ways of working, right? At the core of all of this is getting work done, which is what are the ways of working and that is all context. Right, and that uh, is a place where even for existing employees who've been around, um, there is a relearning that is needed um, today, right? So that's one data point that I wanted to share. The other one is in the context of uh, upskilling and role changes, a lot of organizations are looking at talent mobility, uh, right? And they have internal uh, targets around talent mobility with massive digitalization happening. And I'm sure Sarah is um, doing a lot of this at, at her uh, workplace. Um, this is a data point that I've come across almost 40 to 50% of people are new to a particular role as well, right? Which means that for them to hit the ground running, right? Time to productivity, getting the context uh, of the marketplace, of the role, of the business, and being productive. How do we set them up for success, right? And, and here it's not the generic content that's going to help. It's really enabling these people on the job, right? And these are two data points that I wanted to share. Uh, in support of what uh, Pratima and Sarah uh, have shared so beautifully well. Thanks, Rajiv. Pratima, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to you because in part of your commentary, you talked about, again, linking back to the business outcomes and we touched on measurement really lightly, but just curious to, to learn a bit more around your experience of that. So when it comes to measuring impact of hyper-contextualized learning, uh, how do you do that? Is there a way of doing that? And, and, and what do you typically look at? Well, it's a, it's not an easy one. Any ROI on training is never easy to calculate. We all know that there are many, many intangibles out there. We have the great formulas in place, but uh, you know it's very hard. We can't measure it in terms of pure clean numbers. But we can measure it in terms of the success, the outcomes, in perspective of what role changes we've done. Let's say, you know, cashing on what Rajiv said, so much of internal mobility which happens in the organization. How successful are the people in their newer roles? Have we done the right training to equip them to pick up the new role? So that could be one. Um, in the context of the two programs that I'm running. Uh, and which is absolutely uh, in relevance to what hyper-contextualization means, for me, the kind of projects they're going to deliver as an outcome of this particular um, you know, assignment, or sorry, rather training, the quality of the projects, their ability to pick up the next level role are to me the success criteria. Yes, we do have assessments in place. We do have number-based clearly giving people uh, you know, certain scores, which will tell, the, tell me who are my top rankers, who are my low rankers, all of that. But that just, that just to help the low rankers to do better, that's, that's out. But as an outcome, I would expect at least, let's say I have a batch of 20 that is running, at least 10 of them, 50% because it's the first year uh, to see whether they pick up the next level roles. So all that I'm saying is, are they able to really do what we have trained them for? So that is to my to me the 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 best measurement uh, possible. The rest is of course the satisfaction of the participants, but that's typically what we anyway measure as training functions. Yeah, I like what you shared there, and I know it, it is hard to to measure, and it, it's looking at all the different components that contribute 
to that level of change and, and impact uh, towards the business. And, and as you as we look to the future then, and, and before I hand over to, to my colleagues to talk a bit about some of the how you can start to bring some of what you've both described there so eloquently to life, how do we see the future of hyper-contextualized learning? What does it look like in the future? Sarah, I'll pass over to you for that question. Um, it's an excellent question. I think my, my answer to it will very much build on the things that Prasma was just mentioning, because for, for me, um, the, a fundamental question to our previous conversation around the extent to which we can drive an impact business outcomes through the interventions that we are building, right? Um, that, that's fundamentally what we're, what we're trying to do. And so when we look at the future of learning, a, for me, a real big element of that is the creativity around leveraging data to measure what we're actually doing. And so Prasma, to your point, I would absolutely agree. We, you know, we're also doing things like trying to get creative around leveraging talent management data to um, you know, assess learning outcomes, some of those sorts of things, moving away from that you know, vol volume of completions, right, towards something more insightful. And I think whilst it's, it's not necessarily a case of the tail wagging the dog, so to speak, that it, it's a part of a more holistic talent and learning ecosystem in which hyper-contextualized learning plays a really key role that really, you know, across a whole variety of interventions allows a, a narrative and some data insights around um, here are the business outcomes we're trying to drive. Here's what that means for key roles in the organization, key skills that we need. Here's how we are equipping those roles for success, building those skills. Here's the impact on the business outcomes. So for me, as I look at that, um, hyper-contextualized learning plays a role in a broader ecosystem comprising really strong talent management processes with great data outputs. Um, we as an organization are experimenting with skills first approaches to um, defining roles and supporting talent. Um, so, you know, um, augmenting standard talent management processes with things like skills, self-assessments, manager skills, perspectives and calibrations, segueing into things like adaptive learning, right? Can test in and out of topics and have an objective test of knowledge to support a skills-based assessment kind of approach. And then segueing into hyper-contextualized learning and, and more real, um, and more effective learning interventions to your point Jason that kind of really allow the scale the scaling of learning solutions that otherwise would be delivered kind of in a more classroom or virtual context where you're really limited by the amount of resources you can throw at a solution so um, you know leading to um, really impactful learning at scale through um, talent management skills based approaches yeah. adaptive learning etc to make sure that what you're training on and what you're providing to people is right for the organization and right for your needs and then really harnessing as much data as possible that isn't about completions but is about you know where are people where are people getting confused where are people struggling with this content where are they getting the highlights but not quite executing correctly in a in a simulated work environment etc to keep refining learning and then to keep impacting business outcomes so for me the future of learning is in a broader ecosystem of learning and talent practices that are relentlessly focused on driving business outcome and you know, also focused on capturing insightful data, not just completion data, but insightful data about capability uplift to demonstrate learning's ability to influence and impact the achievement of business outcomes. Yeah. And Rajiv, I can see you nodding your head, head there as well. And we've had conversations around thinking about that in the whole of the ecosystem. Is there anything you would add to that? And yeah, anything you'd add? Yeah. Um... Yeah, great points again from uh, Sarah. I love the angle about uh, starting from business outcomes, working back into talent management practices and seeing how learning sort of enables that, um, right? So uh, keeping that in mind, many organizations that uh, we work with are um, facing this whole uh, digital skill shortage and to the point that uh, Sarah was mentioning as well, you know, everyone's trying to become a skill-based uh, organization. 
uh, that uh, only means that you know there are newer skills that are emerging you know 12 months out and 18 months out how do we prepare people at an accelerated pace for that right and and their generic content may not work it has to um, basically uh, you know josh burson talks about uh, learning in the flow of work and i think that's more about where do you learn uh, but here it's about learning in the context of work right um, given that the time to productivity is just shrinking by the day how do we uh, help people to hit the ground running uh, right i think that becomes an important business priority uh, right and gone are the days when learning programs used to run for five days um, you know two days even now it's shrinking and it has to really be in the flow of work and it has to be in the context of work right more and more it's starting to sound like um, you know learning is there but this is more enabling uh, people on the job uh, right that's uh, gaining a lot more prominence and add to that one more dynamic that you see in the workplace today right so there is um, tremendous attrition in few uh, industries and in some other markets there is great retirement as well so there's a knowledge management issue that organizations are facing right in the span of uh, about six to nine months you've got some critical talent moving away so you need to capture all of that that's highly contextual right what this person knows is tacit how do you capture that how do you cascade that at scale to the rest of the organization i think those are critical business priorities not just learning priorities but critical business and talent priorities today thank you Raju, and thank you all i think that's a good segue as we think about how does this weave into the current things that we're, we're doing that exist at the moment because there's still some good things that i'm sure people are thinking well how do i integrate this into what we're already doing in our organizations and and start to play that out. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague Raga in our, in our uh, product team, who's going to give you a bit of some of that how and, and what we've been working on as part of that. Sure. Thanks so much, uh, Pratima, Sarah, Rajiv, and Jason. A lot of insights, a lot of value over here. And I'm sure that, you know, uh, like post this discussion, a lot of folks are going to go back and discuss the relevance and importance of uh, hyper contextualized learning in today's day and age. Um, so I think uh, just like for a while we discussed the importance of tech with hyper contextualized learning, right? So uh, let me just share my screen and walk you through Genie, right? And what Genie is about and how Genie is ensuring that we can build hyper contextualized learning experiences for your organization and your learners. Great. Uh, is my screen visible, folks? Yes. Uh, so just uh, giving you an overall a comprehensive view of Genie, right? Uh, Genie, again, once again, uh, helps us create hyper-contextualized uh, learning experiences and simulations for you and your learners. Uh, the simulations can be created within a period of just eight to 10 weeks, right? Uh, and these are immersive, engaging simulations. And we have launched about six to eight simulations uh, on this platform already. And we also built uh, quite a few custom simulations for our clients. Uh, which you will get to in a bit. Uh, so moving on to the uh, overarching view of what Genie is about, right? Uh, so it's globally scalable. What this means is that these simulations can be accessed across the globe through different verticals in the company. Uh, they're experiential and hyper-contextual. What this means is that the entire simulation can be created from scratch uh, and they can be contextualized to your learners, right? This can be for first time managers. This can be for senior leadership. Uh, it's customized learning, right? These are customized to your company's learning needs and learning requirements. And it also ensures that learners have an immersive experience. Uh, the great thing about Genie is also that uh, it has an intelligent analytics platform. So a little bit about this, we'll get into in the report section later. But the idea is that how do we ensure that post a learner's uh, completion of a simulation, how do we tie it back to their learning goals and how can they improve going forward? And it's also an engine for rapid development. Like I said earlier, uh, simulations can be created in a short period of just eight to 10 weeks, right? Uh, so this is an overarching view of Genie. Moving on to the Genie, Genie Edge, right? So uh, these are some of uh, like the key features or key elements of a simulation that a learner will experience while going through, right? So we have comprehensive gameplay architecture. A little bit about this. What this means is that the each scenarios that users go through, they design in such a way that there's a few, there's a structure and a logic, uh, and users are getting uh, a learning experience as contextualized to them. There's an extensive set of triggers. 
So these triggers set in when a user is playing a simulation, and this can be time bound, scenario bound, revenue bound, or cost bound. Uh, we have a scaffolding scoring system. A little bit about this. So you can build as many metrics as you want on our system based on our existing evaluation system that we have over here. We have a beautiful UI for great UX, and this is a point that I really love. The reason being that the entire user interface can be customized to your company's branding, themes, design, and any other design requirements that you may have. Uh, we have a comprehensive talent intelligence system, right? So engaging with the simulation is one part of it, but at the end of it, what reports do we provide to the users? What scores do we provide? What tips and information do we provide is crucial to the learner, but also to the organization, right? And by doing this, this ensures that learners have a much longer career path and a growth path in the company. And I think uh, earlier on, we mentioned uh, the importance of AI. I think uh, we spoke about chat GPT much earlier. Uh, so the great part about this is that all of our simulations are now AI enabled. We have recently integrated with NLP, which is called natural language processing, where a user's free text inputs and audio inputs can be put inside the simulation and a user gets a respective score based on his or her inputs. Uh, moving on to some of the use cases that can be customized really quickly, right? There are multiple more, but it's presenting an overarching view over here. Uh, one that we're really proud about is our organization values and cultural pillars, right? Rajiv uh, mentioned earlier that uh, about 50 to 60% of the workforce uh, has joined a company in the last 18 to 24 months, right? So how do we imbibe them with organization values and the cultural pillars to ensure that the organization's objectives are being achieved? We also have DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as new age topics such as emotional intelligence and unconscious biases at a workplace. Uh, other areas such as process and compliance training can be taken care of. And these are some other examples that we have over here. Uh, moving on to our genie based products, right? We have a values and cultural simulation that uh, we just covered, and also a portion ethics simulation, right? In today's day and age, it's important that, uh, and I think it's also a mandate that. Uh, every year, all the employees of the company go through the portion ethics uh, compliances that are uh, that are there in the market. Uh, moving on to two more examples. One is the communication simulation, right? And this is one of our success stories that we will touch upon a little later. Uh, over here, our communication simulation has two elements of AI in it. It has a writing analysis and an audio analysis. Uh, in an audio analysis, a user is actually putting in their input. Uh, and their tone is being assessed over here with their essence and clarity. Uh, and in the writing elements as well, uh, their essence and clarity is being measured. Uh, we have another set of simulations uh, that are built on the Genie platform uh, that can be accessible, uh, that can be accessed through mobile phones actually. So uh, this can be accessed on the go. Users or learners don't necessarily have to be uh, sitting at their uh, desktop or, or workstation at any given point. Uh, moving on to the reporting and analytics, right? So engaging with the simulation, users having a great experience is one part of it. At the end of it, uh, there has to be an element of learning and development that takes place, right? So our cutting edge, uh, you know, intelligence analytics platform ensure, like provides users with a comprehensive report, right? So over here, their overall score is measured. Each competency-based score is measured with also personalized tips to ensure that, you know, this is what they can take away from uh, the learning experience, and they can go and apply it at the workspace. And these are the elements of uh, the NLP that I was referring to earlier, right? Uh, in terms of the communication analysis, speaking and writing. Uh, so this is a little bit about our reporting and analytics. And at the same time, uh, while this is for an individual learner, uh, organizations also receive these reports uh, in terms of how their users have performed and what is the learning path forward. Uh, moving on to our success stories, right? Uh, so the first one, again, like I said, mentioned earlier, uh, is the communication skills and en skills enhancement program that we're building for uh, India's largest IT and consulting service provider, right? Uh, um, this is a general overview. Their problem statement was that they were hiring uh, freshers from tier two and tier three cities, and they wanted to develop their communication skills, right? Communication over here being speaking, listening, and writing. Uh, and then our team has worked really closely with them and we've built an end-to-end -end solution, right? For nearly about 25 to 30,000 employees, this will be accessed by, right? So this has a pre-assessment, a custom simulation and a post-assessment, right? And at the end of it, 
uh, we want to ensure that the overall communication skills develop. Uh, unfortunately, the results cannot be published yet because it's an ongoing program. But in a couple of months, you will see a paper about a, a paper out about how successful this program was. So this is one success story, uh, and the other one is with Tata LXC, right? Uh, accelerating uh, the cultural transformation program that is there. So uh, Tata LXC hires about two thousand professionals every quarter. And for the next about eight to nine quarters, they're going to be onboarding twenty thousand people, right? So it's important that these uh, with these new members joining and coming in, how do they understand uh, the importance of Tata Alexi's cultural pillars and organization values? And uh, Tata Group being one of the largest groups uh, in India, right? They have uh, a very strong belief in their cultural pillars. And then if employees understand their cultural pillars and values, it not only Uh, it ensures that actually uh, learners uh, are achieving the business goals, right? So uh, a little bit about that, and also the the results, right? So this is an ongoing program as well. But in the last quarter, ninety two percent of the attendees rated the program a four point six out of five. The attrition rate reduced by five percent compared to what it was, and there were certain areas where users or learners got a lower score. So this was addressed by in the post simulation debrief. And a career path or a growth trajectory was essentially developed for them, right? Uh, so this is a little about the results. Uh, and um, folks, uh, this brings me to the end of the genie presentation. I'll stop sharing my screen here, and uh, we can spend the next ten minutes taking in any questions or answers that come in from the audience, and we're more than happy to address them, whether it's genie related or it's about Nolskip or uh, anything business that uh, y'all would like to discuss. Thank you so much. Thanks, Raga. I'm going to open it up to the uh, to the audience. If there's any questions, as Raga said, it could be around Genie, it could be around the business, it could be around something that Sarah Pratamore or Ajeev have shared earlier on. But would love to open up to questions. So we've had one come through. So, Ebru, thank you. So, which genie simulations are ready to go for us to share with our clients? Okay, that's. So, which can what ones are ready? What been made as part of that? You mentioned earlier, uh, Raga, that some had been developed through the genie platform. What what what's been developed so far that we 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 can share? So, uh, so we built around six to seven uh, simulations on our Genie platform. I'll give you an example of a couple of them. So, we have an emotional intelligence uh, simulation at work. This is to, you know, increase uh, the emotional intelligence uh, of learners, uh, deliver the importance of it, and how to go about it. We also have an unconscious bias simulation, talking about how unconscious biases at a workplace can essentially have uh, uh, like a negative impact uh, on the workspace and achieving the business goals. Uh, and we also have a couple of database simulations and uh, simulations in the uh, leadership space. So we have about six to seven. Uh, you, we're going to launch a poll in a bit for you all to just get a glimpse of what we have to offer. Uh, but for now, uh, we don't reveal all of them for now. So yeah, I hope that helps. Uh, and if any follow-up questions, feel free to uh, post them uh, on the chat. Thanks for a few of us for the um, a list of some of those that are out there. We can help certainly share those after the call. Any other questions? Okay, I don't know if we want to jump to the poll and 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 look at that. So while uh, we are bringing up the poll, uh, I just wanted to add something in terms of learning design and what we are learning as an organization. I thought it will be interesting. So at Nolske, we talk about the six C's of uh, learning design, right? Uh, obviously, maybe I can quiz all of you. What do you think the six C's are? Um, you know, learning professionals tend to do this to each other, quiz each other. So I'll, I'll get you started. The first C is uh, content, obviously, right? This is a big part of uh, learning design. um any other c's that come to your mind 
yeah, context, obviously, like what we are discussing today is all of that. Um, you know, communities, which is all about social learning, right? It's not just an individual uh, learning something. It's about how does a group learn? And that's how you build learning culture. Then you've got different channels today. You know, you've got in classroom, you've got uh, mobile-based learning, you've got uh, virtual instructor led. So that's channels. Then you've got curriculum, which is basically what's the structure of learning. It's not just about randomly consuming uh, content, but what is the structure, right? You're taking a person from point A to point B. And then finally, one thing that we often overlook is what's the consumption of learning, right? The art and science of driving adoption. Now, I just wanted to add this that today, um, you know, when we look at these six C's, things have dramatically changed, right? From content, we have problem problem of plenty today, right? Just off the shelf content on uh, on different platforms, context changing rapidly, right? From one quarter to the next, um, communities becoming a little hard to build, uh, right? How do you build engagement uh, and build uh, a strong learning culture? You've got different channels, different uh, multimodal ways of um, consuming learning. Uh, curriculum, obviously, you know, how do you create different structures, keeping the individual's learning in mind and consumption, of course, how do you drive adoption at the end of all of this, not just adoption, but ultimately application on the job, right? So we do believe that, you know, uh, many of these elements have to be uh, thought through deeply uh, by learning professionals. So I, I thought I'll just throw that in while the poll was coming up and it's right there in front of us. Uh, did you miss the cost? <laughs> of course, cannot uh, forget the seventh C, so I'll add that to the list. A few people have asked whether we're going to be able to share this. We have recorded it. I'm sure any questions that, that might have been missed, happy to pick up on those and, and make sure we answer those. I'll give another 30 seconds just around the poll, just for people to finish off there. And whilst I do so, I just want to, again, thank you, Sarah, Pratima, Rajiv, for, for such insightful uh, commentary around each of those uh, uh, questions and the topic itself. Um, there's certainly lots to take away from, from those. So thank you for your time and doing that. And uh, I'll leave it open just for a few more minutes, just around questions and uh, to answer the poll. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Stacey. Thanks, Anthony. I'll leave it there. All right. Thank you, everyone. Brilliant. I think that's everyone now that's come through on that. Thanks, George. Brilliant. Let's wrap up there. Thanks, everyone. Pratima, Sarah, thank you again. Really appreciate your time. And Rajiv, thank you so much. I'll leave you there. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thanks, great everyone. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Pratima. Thanks. Thanks, Thank you, everyone. Lovely, Thank you. lovely to chat. Take care, okay. everyone.